Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, and we'll begin in verse 33 and go through verse 41. Again, that's the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, beginning in verse 33. Hear now the reading of the gospel. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, He said, truly this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joses and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And and there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Let us go to him in prayer. O holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So last week we started going through Jesus hanging on the cross and and listening to his prayers as he hung there on the cross. And and we were at, and and his prayer there found in Luke 23 was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that prayer occurred after he was crucified and he's hanging between the two criminals and, and he's being mocked and thrown up there. But then we find here on that day of crucifixion that the sixth hour comes. So all of that occurred before the sixth hour. There was still light outside. Now at the sixth hour, the gospel tells us that darkness came over the land. It became completely, utterly Dark. Now, the sixth hour in Jewish tradition was noon midday. It's when the sun reached its apex at the top of the day. It's when it was at its most bright. And here at the time of day, when the light is supposed to be shining the brightest, it became gruesomely dark. And it stayed dark for three hours, the scripture tells us. Now, we are to understand when reading this that the darkness that overcame Calvary that day for those hours was not the absence of God. Rather, it was the very presence of God coming in the form of judgment and wrath while Jesus hung there on the cross. See, we often put God's presence with light That's how we see it most often described throughout Scripture, as light. But we also see it in the Old Testament texts in Genesis and in Exodus that God comes as darkness at times. And the prophets speak of the day of the Lord that is to come and the darkness that overcomes. In fact, the prophet Amos in chapter 8 verse 9 says these words, And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. This darkness that's overcome that day on Calvary is God's very presence of judgment and wrath. For you see, Jesus 
was not left alone on the cross. The Father did not stop loving him. The Father did not leave him to be alone. But rather, for those three hours, Christ hung there with strength, enduring the judgment and the wrath. Jesus drank from that cup. And the scripture tells us that at the ninth hour, the light came back. For three hours, he endured God's judgment and wrath as an atonement for our sins. And we know that as if we were to go and pay that penalty, it would take longer than all of eternity for us to atone for our own sins. Yet because Jesus is an infinite being, he can withstand God's infinite judgment on our behalf. But when it was over, after the ninth hour, he cries out to God, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's after enduring the judgment and wrath that he cries out. After enduring the anguish of atoning for our sins. And it's the only time in all of Jesus' prayers recorded in the Gospels that he doesn't refer to God as Father, but as God. But he's still crying out. In fact, he's crying out with Scripture, with the very Word of God that's imprinted and etched upon his heart. He cries out the psalmist's words from Psalm 22. And it's there that it's written. Before that great 23rd Psalm, David writes this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am warm, but I am a worm and not a man. Scorned by mankind and despised by the people, all who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. And that's true. Jesus did delight in the Father. He was being mocked as he hung there on the cross with people telling him to save himself or that Elijah would come and save him as he endured the anguish and the agony of the punishment and wrath from God for our sins, not just hanging there on the cross. And that pain. For you see, Jesus, until this moment, really only knew the Father's delight. The Gospel of Mark begins with, Jesus' ministry as he goes and gets baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And it's there when Jesus is baptized, he comes out of the water, the heavens open up, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove, and we hear God speak. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. Jesus knew the Father's delight. But for three hours... Not that the Father's delight went away. No, the Father, God, was most pleased with his Son in this very moment. But the pain and the anguish of judgment and wrath upon him overcame his whole soul. And so he cries out. After the darkness is lifted, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when he cries out with this anguish, it's 
on our behalf, your behalf and mine. So when Jesus hangs there, the darkness is lifted, the judgment and wrath dissipates at the ninth hour, the scripture tells us. It's when Jesus cries out. It's when Jesus finds that he is not being comforted by the Father. And this is the very reality of hell to which Jesus speaks of in the Gospels. Hell isn't the absence of God, but the full presence of his judgment and wrath without ever being comforted and having peace. And we see Jesus cry out, not against God, but to God, still trusting, still loving. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Why is a question we ask God a lot. Why did this happen to me, God? Why am I going through this, God? And here it is. We have a beautiful Savior who understands that hard and difficult question, why? But as Jesus cries out to God, asking, why have you forsaken me? Why? Jesus knows why. Why? The people all around heard this cry, why? Do you know why? Why, Jesus cries. To justify us. To save us. Why? Because of his great love for us. Why? For God's glory. To save sinners of all time from punishment. So we hear Jesus cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? For our eternal good. At the cross, God is glorified. At the cross, Jesus is glorified. At the cross, we see, we hear, and our heart knows without a shadow of a doubt. Yes, Yes, Jesus loves even me. Amen.